And uh, before I start the meeting, I'd like to uh, thank um, our friend who's come to uh, represent the Russian embassy here. Represent, perhaps, is not the right word. Who's come from the Russian embassy. And all I would like to say is you're very welcome and thank you for coming. The crisis in uh, Crimea, in eastern Ukraine, and in Ukraine as a whole, and the crisis between uh, Western Europe and America on the one hand, and Russia, is not a new one. It's a crisis that has been carrying on for a very long time. I not go into the long history, but I'd simply like to say that what is happening in Ukraine is a direct result of the restoration of capitalism in the old USSR and, of course, in Ukraine. In the Soviet times, Soviet Union was the second largest economy in the world. And within the Soviet economy, Ukraine produced industrial goods which per capita were greater than that of either Germany, the powerhouse of Western Europe, or Britain or France. Ukraine was the bread basket of the Soviet Union and produced a quarter of the food that, that the Soviet Union uh, pr produced. So Ukraine was a very important place. Ukraine has 46 million people. It's, after Russia, the second largest country on the continent of, of, of Europe. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, it's rich in resources. Ukraine has exceptionally high development of industry, especially heavy industry, in the eastern part of Ukraine, where the language that is generally spoken is Russian. It's not just Crimea, it's also in eastern Ukraine, where Rus Russian is spoken, and a lot of Russian people are settled, which of course is understandable, because after the uh, uh, um, October Revolution, it was the policy of the Bolshevik government to develop areas not only in central Russia, not only around Moscow and Petersburg, etc., but everywhere. Uh, it's unlike the old colonial powers who went abroad in order to denude people of their resources and to loot them. The Soviet government was the first government in history which actually made sure that the rich region, regions plowed resources into the poorer ones and developed them and brought them to the same level of economic, cultural and social development and, and scientific development. <laughs> since since, since the, rest, the, re, the restoration, Ukraine has been in a state of shambles. Its economy is gutted, its politics is totally uh, uh, rotten, if, if, if you like. And what's happening is that on top of its economic and political problems, there is the constant in imperialist meddling in the, affair, in the, affair, in the affairs of, of U Ukraine. To the European Union and US imperialism, no government in Ukraine is acceptable unless it's pro-imperialist and anti-Russian. That's really the, the basis of it. They want to incorporate Ukraine into not only the European Union, perhaps less in the European Union, because they have their own problems, but definitely they want to incorporate it into NATO in order to take NATO to the borders of Russia. It is an extremely dangerous game, it's a provocative game, and they should have understood it, because in 2008, Russia gave its answer to these attempts to take the, the new Nazi warmongering NATO alliance to the borders of Russia. There was a war in Georgia, and it was a notice given which even the most dim-witted politicians in Western Europe, imperialist though they are, should have been able to understand. Russia said, this far and no further. When the Soviet Union, uh, just before the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the last Soviet president, Gorbachev, uh, not notorious for his, his betrayal, of, betrayal of socialism, the, he had agreed with the then president of, 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 of the United States that the United States would not, would not enroll into NATO the countries of the former socialist bloc, let alone the constituent parts of the former USSR. They have since then enrolled basically every 
member of the former socialist bloc and the Baltic states into NATO. And now they want to come further down, incorporate Ukraine, incorporate Georgia, incorporate Armenia, etc., and basically encircle Russia with a view to causing the disintegration of Russia and causing the dismemberment of Russia. Russia is the only country in the world which can obliterate the United States of America. European, uh, uh, the imperialist hegemony of the United States-led imperialism is not complete unless Russia is dismantled, because Russia stands in the way, along with China, uh, to a considerable extent. So these two countries are always in the crosshairs, and for the moment, Russia is to the forefront because of the situation that has developed. So this intermeddling has led them every now and then, and very frequently, to interfere in the internal affairs of Ukraine. In 2004, the Ukrainians elected a president by the name of Yanukovych. The Americans said they'd voted wrong. <laughs> so either the electorate had to be changed, or somehow the elected president had to be got rid of. So they indulged in the usual method of what they call color revolutions. Every revolution has been given a cover, a color, or some sort of name. <coughs> You, you had the, the, the counter-revolution in Georgia, and the, you have the counter-revolution in a number of other places, and in the case of Ukraine, they gave them color Ukraine. There are PR firms in, in Washington or New York, they design all these packages. You know, like you buy a um, car radio or something, you can buy a certain type of counter-revolution, and for, for the right money, you can get it. So there was a color re revolution. So, persistent protest, they got rid of Yanukovych. And they brought in the pair known as Yushchenko and Timoshenko. Well, that honeymoon between the two of them lasted about eight or nine months. They quarreled with each other and through a number of stages which I have not got the time and you have the patience to listen, listen, listen to them, actually totally disintegrated and once again brought Yanukovych into office in elections which were declared to be fair and perfectly all right. Various representatives of imperialist organizations, including the organization of security and cooperation in Europe were present and they cleared these elections to be fine. Well, that did not stop the attempts of either the US or European Union to pull Ukraine in, into its own orbit. And they were obviously inveigling Yanukovych. I'm no fan of Yanukovych because Yanukovych was not really standing for the defense of the interests of his people. He basically tried to play Russia off against uh, Western imperialism to try and get the best bargain for his lot of people. And eventually he decided that he would sign a Euro uh, a, a association agreement with the European Union. And when he went to sign this agreement, in this capital of a small counter-revolutionary statelet, uh, Lithuania, in Vilnius. He looked at the agreement and he took fright. And he had good reason to take fright. That agreement would have been very, very bad for Ukraine. It would have opened the door for the plunder of Ukraine to Western imperialism. It would have gutted the industry uh, of eastern part of Ukraine and of course it would have uh, basically destroyed the economy and this annoyed imperialism so much that they started agitating again to get rid of Yanukovych again protests start can you just imagine protests are taking place in Kiev protests were not as large as they were portrayed to, to be but anyway, they're taking place. The foreign dignitaries from imperialist countries, foreign ministers of these countries, deputy secretaries of defense from these countries, senators from these countries are visiting what they call the Maidan. I don't know how they got the Indian word for that, that place. You know, it, it means the big square, Maidan. 
they also call it independent square. It's not independent square, it's a square of slavery as far as I'm concerned. It didn't bring independence to Ukraine, it brought, made Ukraine into a cockpit for fight uh, by imperialism to, to, to control it. So they come there and they bring presents. They, they, they distribute biscuits to the population. They, these people must be fools that they should long to sell their sovereignty and their economic and political independence in return for biscuits. <laughs> I come from, I originate from a third world poor country, even I wouldn't sell my country for a packet of biscuits. <laughs> but obviously there are people in Ukraine who are prepared to sell their country, their mother and mother-in-law into the bargain, thrown in as an as a extra gift for a packet of biscuits. Anyway, they organized these demonstrations. These demonstrations were reaching nowhere. So they bring in mercenaries from America, from Israel. And what do they do? They shoot. They're snipers. They're shooting from left and from right. And it's so portrayed that it's the Ukrainian security forces are firing at people and then some people are firing in defense. Somebody who ran a mobile clinic at the place, who now is health minister in the new government, actually stated to the Latvian foreign minister that the people shooting from both sides were exactly the same. That bullets were the same, they were issued from the same armory, but actually they were trying to create a scene so that it would look that the Ukrainian government is dictatorial, it is bloodthirsty, and it has got to be got rid of. Anyway, under extreme pressure, Yanukovych then signed an agreement which was brokered by who? The foreign ministers of Poland, France, and Germany, under which the presidential elections were brought forward to the end of this year. There was to be a unity government, and Yanukovych was to carry on as being the president. Within days, this was not acceptable to the fascists who were leading these demonstrations, fascists from the Svoboda Party and the Fatherland Party, and of course, supported by imperialism. Within days, that agreement was gone. They had, through intimidation, violence, and a military push, they had got rid of that government, and Yanukovych had to flee the country and reach Russia. This is re, uh, what has happened. John McCain was there. Carrie was there, Victoria Newland was there. Now when Victoria Newland was there, she actually speaks on the telephone to the American ambassador in Kiev. And during the long conversation, she's not happy with what the European Union is doing. So she says, that's a very cultured language that American high officials use. <laughs> she said, fuck the European Union. Now, all the press has concentrated on her rude language and secondly, the thing, that the thing was leaked. But the substance of her conversation is totally forgotten. She's basically dictating on the telephone to the American ambassador what kind of government would be acceptable and who should be the prime minister. <laughs> and after this military putsch, who do you think is the prime minister? The one named by Victoria Newland whom, of course, she can't pronounce his whole name. She calls him Yetz. And Yetzinuk is the prime minister of this illegitimate outfit. When that had happened, what do you expect Russia to do? Russia says, well, yeah, this is the way things run, and we must mind our own business, and we will therefore uh, not do anything. Russia then did a number of things. First of all, Russia said it would not recognize this, this illegal government. Secondly, Russia said that it would not accept a constitution in Ukraine which is not properly federalist. I, regions must have rights and regions' rights and particularly of minorities and especially Russian-speaking minorities must be, must be protected. That was Russia's position. Of course, the Americans won't listen to this, and the European Union won't listen to it. But the people in Eastern Europe, and especially in Crimea, were extremely angry, and they made sure that their anger was felt. 
And you know, imperialism is a great teacher. If the imperialists cannot tolerate an elected government in Kiev, what reason is there for other parts of the world, and especially in eastern Ukraine and Crimea, to not follow that example? They call a counter-revolution revolution, but the people in Crimea and Eastern Europe are involved in a real revolution against the fascist coup in Kiev. Eastern Ukraine. I, I'm sorry, I can constantly do this. I apologize. Eastern Ukraine. And so the people in Crimea took over buildings, surrounded the um, military bases uh, that uh, belonged to the Ukrainian state. And eventually, in March, they held a referendum. And the referendum, 82% uh, of the population took part in the referendum, of which over 96% decided for the option of joining Russia. And the Russian parliament, the Russian courts, as well as, of course, President Putin, accepted that decision and incorporated Crimea into Russia. And they said, Crimea has come home. I completely agree with Crimea has come home. Crimea should never have gone somewhere else. It is thanks to that disgusting um, person who's responsible for so much of the misfortunes in the former Soviet Union, Khrushchev, that in 1954 it was given as a gift by the Soviet Union to the fraternal people of Ukraine. What was the need to give it as a gift? I mean, what was it that... Uh, did, did the Ukrainians not have the right to visit, visit Crimea? It, it, it had been there 200 years. It had been far part of Russia ever since Catherine the Great uh, won, it, won it in the, in the late 18th, 18th century. It, 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 it was handed over. It should never have been handed over. But anyway, be that as it may. And when, of course, uh, Crimea was incorporated into uh, Russia, it's lovely to hear what imperialist politicians are saying. They're saying the most sacrosanct principle of international system is the inviolability of the borders and territorial integrity of any country. <laughs> Just look around and ask yourself who is going around everywhere violating this principle of international law you wouldn't have difficulty doing that. The, the Financial Times editorial of the 3rd of March said that Russia's behavior is a brazen disregard for international law. And it confirms Putin's reputation for cold ruthlessness. Well, even if Putin wanted to be cold and ruthless, and I wish him well if he wants to be cold and ruthless, <laughs> Even if he wanted to be cold and ruthless, he couldn't be as cold and ruthless <laughs> as the imperialist politicians are in pursuing their strategy of world domination. <laughs> they go on to say that Russia's behavior is a violation of the United Nations Charter. <clears throat> that it's a violation of the sovereignty of another state. John Kerry, this is, this is really a gem. The American Secretary of State says it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible act of aggression by Moscow. John Kerry, who participated in the genocidal war against the Vietnamese people. He was an American soldier who killed Vietnamese. It's an incredible act of aggression, and I can't see the Vietnam War was anything other than an, an incredible act of aggression. He says, you just do not in the 21st century behave in the 19th century fashion by invading another country on a completely trumped up pretext. <laughs> now, you are all politically educated and erudite people. I don't need to give you examples. Was the it, war against Yugoslavia, the war against Iraq, the war against Afghanistan, the war against Syria, the war against Libya, what all these examples of 19th century imperialism or 21st century decent uh, regard for the rights of sovereign states? You can make up your mind on the, on the, on the, on the subject. Yeah, 
And of course, the Financial Times, as indeed many other um, bourgeois organs, called for sanctions against Russia, to which a decent American living in New Jersey wrote saying, America has very little right to complain about what Russia has done. America, ever since its existence, had actually regarded the whole of Latin America as its backyard and has committed aggression against country after country. What's more, it has interfered in the, in the affairs of these countries under what was unilaterally proclaimed and was known as the Monroe Doctrine, that no European state has the right to interfere in the affairs of Latin American countries, which means only the United States had the right to interfere. And sometimes without even that pretext, it has invaded countries. And then this gentleman from New Jersey goes on to ask the Financial Times, Sir, I didn't hear you ask for sanctions against the United States and other countries who invaded Iraq, Afghanistan and other countries. So why are you asking for it? Financial Times, of course, has, has, has no, no, no answer to, to, to that. President Obama um, said, well, we want to have good influence on neighboring countries, but we generally do not invade them. <laughs> I think the emphasis should be on generally, perhaps, but or even, even, <laughs> even, 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 that, even that would have to be greatly qualified, because they, they generally do invade. <laughs> they generally do invade. I mean, if you look at America's territory, apart from the fact that it's built, it's probably the apart from Australia, is the only country that's built on a successful experiment in genocide. Its territory, if you look at it, is nearly half of it is come to, ca captured from Mexico. You know, look at California, look at New Mexico, look at Colorado. All that is captured from, from uh, Mexico, if you like. That's what America does. And it has bases in over 100 countries around the world. It has no business to be there. Can you just imagine what the result would be? If the Russian army was conducting exercises on the border between Mexico and the United States, next to the state of Arizona, what problems that would cause? You know the uh, 1962 Cuba Missile Crisis. Cuba had every right to invite Soviet missiles, and Soviet Union had every right to send them. And it led to a near confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. So there are, there's one set of rules for America, and there's one set of rules for the countries on whom it has designs. And that's what uh, the United States uh, does. So the Crimeans, obviously, have responded by taking the only action they can do, I, we do not want to stay in a state which is ruled by fascist putches. Now, in this country, they constantly go on and on and say, there's a party here called UKIP, United Kingdom Independence Party. And every bourgeois politician turns his nose up and saying, it's a bit racist. They say the same thing about the Hungarian government. I take no particular responsibility for the Hungarian government. But why are they so much downplaying the fascists who are in the Ukrainian government? Ukrainian government has got five ministers who have fascist allegiances. One of the two parties that are supporting it, among others, are the Svoboda Party and the um, right center party. So Woboda party is a direct descendant of an organization in the Second World War which was in Ukraine called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. It was headed by Stepan Bandera. They were fascists who fought on the side of the German fascists at a time when the Soviet people and the people of the world were engaged in a mortal struggle in the fight against fascism. Let it be said to the honor of the Soviet citizens generally and also the citizens of the Soviet Ukraine that they fought shoulder to shoulder together with each other to defeat the Nazi hordes. <laughs> Notwithstanding a few traitors, you know, 
as 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 as, as Vyshinsky said during the Moscow trials, you know, there is always filthy scum somewhere. There were some filthy scum, and there were filthy scum in Crimea, the Tatars, and filthy scum in Chechnya. And after the Second World War, they were expelled from these areas. They were expelled from these areas because the Soviet criminal code made them liable for their collaboration with the Nazis. This was a punishment. Secondly, they were cleared from that area so that the area would never again become a base for fascist agitation and propaganda. And thirdly, and even more importantly, this was done because people who had collaborated with the Nazis were not exactly the flavor of the month with the Soviet citizens who lost 27 million people. They would not have been able to tolerate these fascist uh, quizlings among them. So even to save their own lives, they were sent to Central Asia, Kazakhstan and, 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 and various other places. This is always attributed to the brutal methods of Stalin that they were expelled. This is exactly what had to be done. It was the right, right, right thing to do. <laughs> Motivated by a desire to down, uh, to, 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 to actually bring down uh, uh, Stalin's reputation and prestige, Khrushchev again allowed these people to come back. Right? What reason is there to allow them to come back? They didn't all come back, but quite a few came, and they are the ones who now want to cause trouble. The Chechens are causing trouble because they, they, they want to fight against the Russian Federation. And they didn't dare do that in, in Soviet time. They didn't dare do that in, in, in Stalin's time. But they every now and then do that. And of course they get help from such lovers of freedom as the United States of America, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and all, 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 all those people who get terribly upset that their principles of democratic uh, <laughs> <laughs> systems have been broken if a female drives a car in Riyadh. Now, these are the Democrats that are supporting the, 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 these, move, these movements. And of course, um, but whatever they do, the basic fact of the matter is overwhelming majority of the people in Crimea accept the verdict of the referendum as legitimate and they have by a free vote decided to join Russia. And you should have seen the pictures of the jubilant crowds waving Russian and Soviet flags near the monument to, 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 to Lenin. And contrast it with that with Kiev, where the, the fascists are actually waving the Bandera um, ba banners and smashing the statue, giant statue of the, of the great, great land, attacking communist deputies in parliament and attacking co co communists everywhere. That is exactly the position that, 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 that is taking place. The leader of Swoboda Party, Te Tehani Bok, described Yanukovych's regime as a Jewish Muscovite conspiracy. And to the shame of the Jewish people, Israeli Zionists are sending sabotage in Ukraine to side with the fascists over there. The very fascists who had killed, among other people, among communists and trade unionists and Russians, who had killed a lot of Jews and actually committed massacres along with the Nazis. As, as, uh, uh, they had organized a battalion called the Galician uh, Battalion during the Second World War. And the, the Zionists are so intent upon serving imperialism that they are quite prepared to overlook this question. Tomorrow these fascists might kill the remaining Jews in Ukraine, but what matters to them now is to serve US imperialism, and that's what they're doing. There's an Israeli soldier of Ukrainian origin. He obviously migrated somewhere to Israel. He doesn't use his real name. His name is Delta. He's just adopted a name Delta. And he actually goes around in that name. He says, oh, these people are not fascist. They're quite really nice. I get on very well with them. But then in the same breath he goes on to say, I use the name Delta because if I used my real name, I would be worried about my safety. <laughs> well, really, really nice, nice, really nice, nice, nice friends he's got. But of course, 
and I don't really wish to insult small African countries. Russia is not Rwanda Burundi. You know? American imperialism threatens Russia and says, we will take action against you. Okay? You will take action. But what action will you take? We are not going to allow 20 of your people to visit Harrods in London. <laughs> I live in London. I have not visited Harrods for 10 years and have not felt terribly deprived as a result of not having visited Harrods. Right? They will expel Russia from G8. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, quite rightly said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, G8 is not very important. It's the G20 that is important. You know, it's, the world is no longer guided by, by G7. It's, it's, it, there are new economies coming, come, come, coming on the scene, and G20 20 is the one. They say, we'll not buy Russian gas. Right. <laughs> Just don't buy Russian gas coming winter and see what the reaction of your cold populations is, is going to be. Or we're going to send the shale gas from the United States of America. <laughs> well, apparently, according to calculations made by experts, to supply the half of the Europe's energy needs, because Europe, Western Europe gets a third of its energy needs satisfied, uh, by purchase of energy from Russia. It would take four million journeys between the United States and Europe. Tanker journey. Sorry? Tanker. Tanker. Well, obviously, the journey is by tanker. You don't walk the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It'll take four, four million journeys. And they haven't got the tankers. The pipes for transporting shale gas to the coast have not yet, yet been built. And if you include the cost of transporting, it would be far too expensive. Europe is already uncompetitive. You think Europe is going to buy energy at expensive prices to become even more uncompetitive. Americans are pushing for hard sanctions against Russia. Yes, Americans can push for it because Americans don't stand to lose so much from these sanctions. But the ones who are going to lose are the British, the French, the Germans. And although their rhetoric is the same because they've got to be appear to be singing from the same hymn sheet, the moment the song is over and they go somewhere into some back room, dissension starts straight away. London doesn't want sanctions. Whatever Cameron may say, they don't want sanctions because London is the home to a lot of Russian money that is deposited. Over 150 billion sits in the city of London. You think these sharks who go everywhere, and just remember, since the Second World War, Great Britain, Britain, United Kingdom, has interfered in foreign countries' affairs through its armed might 130 times. Now they are the ones complaining about Russia. 130 times this little country has interfered in other people's, people's affairs. It's a properly imperialist country. It's bloodthirsty. And it's bloodthirsty because it's motivated by the interests of its finance capitalists who manipulate everything. You think they're going to lose the Russian money so that they can please America? No, they're not going to in the final analysis. Germans have investments in Russia, they have great trade with Russia, and they have investments in other parts nearer Russia. You think they are going to jeopardize those investments to play second fiddle to Uncle Sam? France sells arms to Russia, and French banks also have an exposure of something like $50 billion to Russia. They are not going to, whatever the socialist Mr. Holland says when he can find the time for these things. <laughs> Whatever Monsieur Holland say, says, he, they are not going to do it. So when you look at the scene today, actually after the, the bravado, the discussion about Crimea has almost disappeared. It has become common fact, not in words, but in practice, between Russia 
and Western imperialism that Crimea belongs to Russia and there's no dispute about it. What they're really now concerned is what will happen to Eastern Europe, uh, sorry, Eastern Ukraine. <laughs> what really matters is East Ukraine. East Ukraine is not safe anymore. People in Donetsk, in Odessa, in Dnipropetrovsk, Lugansk, Kharkov, everywhere have revolted against the fascist government in Kiev, which they regard as illegitimate. <laughs> they have declared themselves to be independent republics of these areas. And the Kiev fascists gave an ultimatum three days ago, giving the opposition in these areas 48 hours to clear out of government buildings or face the Ukrainian army. 48 hours passed 24 hours ago. <laughs> this threat has remained honored in breach rather than in observance. And there's a good reason for it. Because these people who are barricading themselves in, in big buildings and organizing themselves and gathering a lot of crowds around themselves have said, whatever you do, we are not going to leave these areas. Come, come and face us, if you will. And then not only ordinary citizens, a lot of people who were members of the police and the security forces of Ukraine have deserted, thrown away their uniform and badges, and joined the demonstrators. Can you just imagine during the miners' strike of 84, 85, if the police sent to beat the miners up had thrown away their sh shields and said, miners are our brothers, we're joining them. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher would have seen reason within half an hour. She was not as stupid as she looked. She, she would have said, no, well, you know, it's a small matter. We saw, solve, solve these problems in a British way through compromise, <laughs> nego 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 negotiation and dialogue. And that's what's happening there. It's not just and, and, the, and, 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 the, and the chief of this illegal fascist government, yet senior, has even said yesterday, I listened to the, uh, to, the, to the news, that they are not opposed to federalization of the country. Two days ago they were saying, no way can we accept federalization. We will protect the rights of minorities and of the Russian language. The very people who passed legislation declaring that Russian was no longer the official language in any part, part of Ukraine. 